Uh, I'd like to hear about, about this. Uh, thanks a lot for the opportunity to talk here about searching searches for axion-like particles in particular in heavy ion collisions. And, um, and the talk it will have three parts. First, setting the stage a bit about axion-like particles and the connection with heavy ions. Then I will show the most recent results on ALP searches for Atlas and CMS. There's a dedicated talk um, on LHCB results for that. And then I will outline a bit the challenges that these measurements present. So axion-like particles, um, they, they come from axions, obviously, which were postulated in 1977 by Petty and Crin to solve this strong CP problem. They are very light scalar particles, and they do couple to photons. And there is a well-defined relation between the coupling and the mass of these particles. This is shown in this figure where you see the axion mass on the x-axis and the coupling to photons on the y-axis. And in this band, this is just limited by two different models, lies the QCD axion, which solves the strong CP problem. Now, if you get rid of this relation, uh, of this coupling relation to the mass, then we come to axion-like particles, which could be any pseudoscalar particle with similar couplings um, to standard model particles as axions. But they can be much heavier in particular. And the motivation for heavy ALPs, so with masses larger than MeV, and there, there are two main motivations. One is, be, is that it could actually be dark matter. This is preferable for light ALPs, so below an MeV, but it could also be mediators to dark matter. And this is also true for heavy ALPs. And then, um, which is very interesting in light of the most recent result on G minus two, um, axions or axion-like particles could actually explain the discrepancy seen in the G minus two um, measurements. So this is a, obviously a very active field. And just to give you an overview, there are several ex experiments searching for axions that exploit the coupling to photons. There is resonant microwave detection a la ADMX or haystacks, which are sensitive in the microelectron volt mass range. There's helioscopes like CAST and YAXO, which are sensitive in the not between nano electron volts to electron volts. So here in the exclusion plot, you see the CAST limit here, which spans this huge range, whereas the cavity based experiments are these green lines here. And then we have Accelerator-based experiments, the fixed target and beam dump experiments, um, where NA62, 64, and SHIP are to be mentioned. They are sensitive in the range for MeV to GeV. And then we have the LTC experiments, and there's a new one in town, Phaser, which will be sensitive in the range 10 to 100 MeV. And then we have ATLAS and CMS uh, in proton-proton heavy ion collisions, which are sensitive in the MeV to hundreds of GeV range. And as I mentioned for LHCB, there is the, the talk which was scheduled after mine um, by, by uh, uh, Rangel. Okay, so let's look at the interactions of axion like particles. In general, they can couple to electric gauge bosons, so Z boson and photons. The observable process there would be photon photon uh, produce an axion and decays to photon photon again. This will be the most interesting one in the end. And then we have uh, set bosons, which can decay into an axion and a photon, leading to a three photon final state. They might also cover two gluons. So then this opens up gluon initial states. They can also couple, most likely, to standard model Higgs. And in this case, we can have Higgs decays two axions if kinematically allowed and then two four photons. Or we can also have the case of Higgs to set axion and then two photon to lepton in the final state. And eventually, if it would also couple to standard model fermions, we can have leptons in the initial state, which is very interesting for Bell, for instance. Um, but also, this is where the contribution to G minus two comes into play, where the muon could couple to an axion which effectively changes the coupling to the photon of the muon. Okay, so as you see, most of them actually have photon final states. Now, this is a good place to look. Now, the question is, which initial state would we like most? Albeit having a huge cross-section for the colored initial states, in particular the LHC, 
Uh, this is very a very dirty environment because we have lots of backgrounds which can also produce photons in the final state. Uh, therefore, it's most appreciated or most clean to look at this process photon photon produces an axion going to two photons again and nothing else. So this would be fantastic to see. And for this, we need a photon collider. And this is where heavy ions come into play. So if you look at heavy ions and in particular ultra peripheral heavy ion collisions, this is a fantastic source of high energy photons. So we have the relativistic nuclei, the lead ions and the equivalent photon flux scales with the charge of the nuclei to the power of four. So this gives a huge photon flux, much enhanced compared to proton-proton beams. The maximum energy of these photons is given by the Lorentz boost of the particles divided by their radius, which is at LHC conditions with lead ions about 80 GeV. And then we can have um, a few interactions, actually various interactions. So we can do with the photons in the initial state exclusive J-psi productions or exclusive meson production. We can do photoproduction of jets, or we can do photon-photon interactions, which would be most interesting for us. And then one can do either light by light scattering, which is this box with the QED box um, in between, or one could have an axion like particle um, resonantly produced. And one thing to note here is that whatever the process is, the beam particles, the heavy ions, they actually stay intact. So we already discussed, we had this nice presentation about the LHC, and this is just to, to summarize up the proton, uh, the lead lead running conditions that we had. So they had about one month data per year with 75 nanosecond bunch spacing and a pileup of essentially zero. So 0 0.004. And most of the interactions are actually electromagnetic ones, and they can be used for, for the heavy ion, for searches for new physics there for photon physics. So how do these events look like? This is one example from Atlas, where you see beautifully two entries in the electromagnetic calorimeter and nothing else, in particular, nothing in the track cut here, except for a bit of noise. So this is two photons, a, a beautifully clean event and a candidate event for type by light scattering or also for an axion. So the experimental section has these two exclusive photons, which are back to back in phi. So this is in view of the beam direction. This is the phi direction. They're back to back there, which is measured in terms of the reduced acoplanarity defined like this. And the cross section for just photon photon scattering with the box diagram in between is deeply falling um, with the invariant mass of the photons, which you can see here. And um, where ATLAS is sensitive for CMS, it's similar, is about an uh, energy threshold of two and a half GeV for a single photon. And that means for the invariant mass, we start to be insensitive here around five GeV of the invariant mass. It's a very unusual topology and energy range for high energy collider experiment. And that's the interesting challenge and what makes it actually very fun to do. Uh, that it is very different is shown shown here. So shown in the upper right is a standard proton-proton collision with a couple of jets and a lot of activity in the calorimeter. Down here is a standard heavy ion collision where the detector nicely lights up. And then we have the photon scattering event where the detector is basically empty. So talking a bit more about the event selection, if you now actually want to record these events, we first have to trigger on those, of course. This is one challenge that also was already outlined in the introduction to the workshop, and I will talk about this a little bit more. Then we want exactly two photons with as low energy threshold as possible. It must be inside the tracking volume of the detector um, so that we can discriminate the photons from electrons. And note that I just took the numbers from the ATLAS measurement because this is the one I know by heart. And then the invariant diphoton mass is, uh, should be as low as possible. And it, it's above 5 GeV actually for both the CMS and the ATLAS measurement. Then any extra particle activity within the tracking volume is vetoed. So no reconstructed tracks. We go down to 100 MeV for this. No reconstructed tracks in the pixel detector that we can go even a little bit lower in momentum. 
then the photons must be back to back and the transverse momentum of the two photons must be very low to reject cosmic muons and there's the, the cut on the reduced coplanarity. What we also reject with this is in particular with the no tracks cut is events like shown in the lower part where we actually have an e plus e minus pair and the low energy e plus e minus are bent by the magnetic field of the tracker away so we reconstruct two tracks and two photons and if we don't allow any tracks then these events are not reported anymore so what else has the signature what about backgrounds we have central exclusive production of two photons so this is two gluons producing two photons in the final state and for this as it's a colored initial state the the uh, gluons carry a larger intrinsic transverse momentum than if compared to an electromagnetic interaction so the photons in the final state will not be as back to back as before which leads to a broader shape in this acoplanarity distribution and it can be discriminated on data also, the chance that the, pro that the lead ions dissociate is higher if uh, the larger momentum transfer happens. So if we look in the beam direction for remnants of the lead ions, we can also detect these events with some efficiency. For E plus E minus pairs that are produced and misidentified as photons because the tracks are missing for some reason, and this is also a background and actually, as the electrons are bent in the magnetic field, as just shown before, this also leads to larger distribution of the acoplanarity distribution again, so it can also be discriminated. And as it turns out, everything else is negligible for this purpose. So exclusive dimeson production, Botomonia production, fakes from cosmic rays or pyrometer noise is all negligible compared with these backgrounds. And it, the, the result looks like this plot again is taken from Atlas, and what is shown here is the acoplanarity distributions or the measure how good the photons are back to back shown for the light by light uh, scattering which is labeled signal here so just photon photon to photon photon and compared to the two backgrounds i discussed central exclusive production and electrons and for axion like particles now they would also be perfectly back to back because if you remember the Feynman diagram it's just and essentially an external exchange of the axion and photons in the initial and final state for this. So this brings me to this point that all of these backgrounds, including the light by light scattering, they don't produce any peak in the mass distribution, whereas the axion signal would. And this is the clear separation between these two and also a way to detect axion-like particles in this data. So here's a brief history of the experimental results. Uh, there was data taken in 2015 and in 2018 by uh, CMS and by ATLAS. CMS published the first result with 14 candidates event from 2015 data on light by light scattering. And then ATLAS followed with 13 candidate events with slightly different thresholds on the lower energy. And then there's also a result from the 2018 data. And the most recent one is the combination by Atlas of the 2015-2018 data amounting to 2.2 inverse nanobahn recorded data with a lower ET threshold of 2.5 GV. And in total, there were about 100 candidate events observed. And then uh, the, uh, the cross-section of light by light scattering could be um, measured, but it could also be recast in limits on axion-like particles. So, Looking at that, what was done is just that you take the inverse mass spectrum and then one can take Monte Carlo simulation for how axions would look like in the, in, as the shape of them in the inverse mass distribution. This was done for several mass points. And as you see here, this is essentially the reconstruction efficiency of an axion like particle signal. And for masses above 20 GV, it's very high, it reaches about 80%. For lower masses, it's actually quite low, it's only about 20%. And combining uh, this- Five minutes left. <laughs> five, five, minutes. Again? Uh, five minutes left. I'm just uh, giving okay. you the, the, the benchmark. Yes. <laughs> okay, yes. please Thank go you. ahead. So um, combining this, um, one, one obtains a limit 
which is shown here. And now putting this into perspective, which makes it more interesting, is uh, on the right-hand side, you see the first limits from the LHC on axion-like particles. Actually, the first limit was from CMS, from proton-proton running, which you see up here, the mass on the x-axis and uh, one over lambda, the coupling on the y-axis. Then the thick black line here is a recast of the Atlas 2016 result um, by Knapp et al. And then the most recent result is shown in this new colorful plot where the CMS result is shown here, the most recent one, and the Atlas result here on top. And you see that in this mass range from a few GV to about 10 GV, uh, sorry, to about 100 GV, this actually provides the most stringent limits on the coupling of axion light particles to photons, uh, which is very impressive. And then for lower masses, we're just not sensitive because of the uh, energy threshold of the photon reconstruction and triggering. And for higher masses, the proton proton, um, the proton proton analysis are much more sensitive, in particular if they use Higgs decays to axions um, as, as analysis channel. So the question is now how can we go, can we become more sensitive and how can we go lower in threshold? And this I would like to briefly discuss by discussing the experimental challenges. So first of all, there's the tracker requirements. We had dedicated triggers in Atlas for the 2018 run to do this analysis, which already were down to requiring only one electromagnetic cluster with a transverse energy of larger than one GeV plus a V2 on the total energy in the calorimeter. And then uh, a second requirement or second tricker chain requiring two electromagnetic clusters above one GeV. Now, if you compare this with the cluster noise we have in the calorimeter of about one GV, this is about as low as you can, can go. And then on the higher level trigger, there was, was not really much done. And the trigger efficiency for this trigger here is at five GV where the analysis starts, it's, it's about 50%, it's actually not so bad. And it even goes a bit lower, right? So we, we, we could go low, maybe down to four GV with this trigger. So how to improve on this? Well, if we use a topological trigger and already require that we have two clusters which are back to back on the level one trigger, we could go a little bit lower in, in the thresholds, but not significantly more. So one could maybe go from five GV in run mass to three to four, but going lower is, is really difficult with the, with the current detector. Concerning the photon reconstruction in this Atlas analysis, we just used the default reconstruction algorithm and custom-made photon identification, but, but this was not too important. Interesting here is that the photon reconstruction efficiency, which you see in this figure um, on the x-axis, essentially it's the photon transverse energy for the two and a half GeV photons, it's just above 50%. And uh, yeah, there one could improve with a custom-made identification of the photons, but um, much lower again, one cannot go. So what one could do to go to lower masses is one could actually uh, move away from the cut on the transverse photon energy to just selecting the cluster energy, and then look in the very forward direction as large as the tracker volume is. And then by the kinematics and uh, using that some of the events are longitudinally boosted, one could actually reach to lower, to down to lower axion masses with this. And um, a simple calculation showed that within the tracking volume of 2.0 eta smaller than 2.5 and the cluster threshold of one GV, one could reach invariant masses, something somewhere between one and two GV if we manage to trigger on these events. But this is about the limit with the current detector. And for lower couplings, well, we just need more data, right? Run three brings about five times more stats, as we heard. And increasing the trigger and recoil efficiency by 20, 30%. So most optimistically, about a factor of two overall um, on, on, the, um, on the efficiencies here, that uh, then brings a factor two to three on the sensitivity maybe. One word on PP. 
So these are complementary analyses, in particular for large ALP masses larger than 100 GeV. They use photon final states, and then they can start using the forward proton tackers and can use a full PP start. So this is something then where uh, the, the heavy ions cannot compete with, even using photons in the initial state. And uh, using the couplings of the Higgs or Z boson, well, this probes a different coupling. So this is really complementary to what is done with the photon initial and final states. And uh, these can be tagged even in the pileup environments and from masses from the MeV to several tens of GeV region. So in conclusion, the LHC is a superb photon-photon collider when using UPC events. It's very well suited to study axion-like particles. CMS and ATLAS already published results within the March range 5 to 100 GeV, and it's the most stringent limits to date. And there is room for improvement, so we could lower the mass threshold, but only a little bit, not by huge factors, and also improve the limit with the data from run three. And uh, that's all I wanted to share with you. Thanks a lot. Uh, Susan and then David. So Susan, please go ahead. Yeah, thanks a lot. Um, I have a question on the cross-section uh, calculation. Could you go back to slide eight, I think it was? Uh, now it's going forward. Which one do you mean? Slide eight, where yeah. you estimated just the total cross section of um, light by light processes. Slide eight. Eight. So this is slide eight. Ah, yes, exactly. I wanted to see that plot in the lower yeah. right corner. So this is for a specific ALP scenario or what goes into, into oh, the estimate? This, this is actually completely without axion-like particles. This is really just the photon-photon to photon-photon cross-section. If we have, um, if we look at this diagram. In the standard model? Exactly. This is standard model using the box diagram and um, charged particles, so, so charged leptons and fermions in the loop. Okay, I see. So that's basically the reference that we have to compare with if we exactly. want to that's be sensitive to our Exactly. exactly. Mm -hmm. Then I have a follow-up question on that. So how likely it is, is it to uh, for several photons to be emitted in one um, lead collision, lead lead collision? So is it is it expected that from one red, one red lead collision um, only one photon is emitted and this is the way you calculate the cross-section or no. is there a high luminosity for having several of them and thereby an enhanced cross-section compared to, to just proton-proton? So, so what we actually did is here we calculated an effective photon flux. Um, so we, we didn't really have the, the number of photons per event but just a, an integrated flux of photon, which depends on the beam intensity and the energy. And uh, with this, we have much more than two photons. So we can have much more than two photons. Mm -hmm. But if you're asking if we can have pileup, so, so two photon scattering events in the same event, um, then the answer is no, this is extremely unlikely. And which can see by just looking at the total number of events that we see. So in general, to have even only one of those is extremely unlikely. Mm. So you basically would count one photon-photon uh, collision per lead or per bunch even? I think on average it's less than, than one photon-photon collision per bunch. Mm -hmm. Okay. In this energy regime. Yeah, and also, I mean, the, the basically the collision energy would not be um, fixed but would be spread right so it's a yes. distribution of yes of again the, the, the collision energy essentially is described here by the invariant mass spectrum so mm -hmm. it's exponential spectrum yes. okay thanks a lot that helped if, if i might comment i think uh, it was not very clear what uh, uh, let me see photon 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 interactions there are many i mean the cross section is in the in the kilobar range okay photon photon going to the leptons of low masses, this is huge. That's the main reason why the uh, ions uh, uh, 
lose uh, their orbit. And that's the main reason of the luminosity burn off that was discussed in the previous uh, talk. Now, so photon photon interactions, they, they, they are huge, the skill of art. Um, and, um, and these produce pairs of uh, the electrons. Now, photon photon going to photon photon, then you have to go through this uh, standard model uh, charge fermion loop. And then, of course, this is very much suppressed. That's why light by light scattering was never observed before. But the probability to have uh, photon photon interactions per bunch crossing is huge, it's humongous. Actually, Z alpha is 0 0.6. So even this is not, even the, the standard QED does not work. We should be using the nonlinear QED. There are many other exchanges. Uh, when, the two, uh, when the two ions pass uh, close to each other, they exchange many soft photons beyond the, the one that produces a central system in a gamma-gamma in a interaction. Thanks, that makes sense. I mean, for, for soft photon emission, there's, a, there's certainly high luminosity, right? But then to get to, to really higher ALP masses, you would need to pump more energy into it. And at that point, it becomes much less likely to happen. Mm, the problem is, um, the problem is uh, that we don't know how to, first of all, we don't know how to trigger on it. And, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and secondly, um, uh, the, at least uh, CMS and ATLAS detectors are not adapted to look for uh, things below um, a few GB. So we cannot reconstruct photons below a few GB. So uh, with good resolution. Uh, so maybe you could even imagine you could have a, a peak somewhere. I mean, uh, if, you, if you have a, a very broad resolution, you, you will see uh, uh, it's very difficult to fish out. And... Um, and then you have this uh, continuum, the gamma gamma level at continuum that is that, that that is there, and then you have the the gamma gamma to uh, to the electrons, electron positron that I mentioned, that this is a very large background. So at the end, yes, we could be producing uh, Alps at low masses right now, but I don't see any way how we can see them with the current detectors at the LHC and with the with the other backgrounds. Um, I have myself a question for uh, for uh, Christoph uh, regarding your uh, triggering at low masses. Can you go back to things like 18 or 19? Uh, uh, sorry, eight. I mean, not nine. Uh, slide slide eight. Ah, uh, no, no. Sorry, I was wrong. Tr I was, triggering, you mean? You mentioned that you can go to low masses, and I want to understand how you want to do this in Atlas because in a, in CMS we cannot. Uh, we have lots of noise. I mean, calorimeter noise in a slide 19. Yes. Sorry, it's like 19, 19. Um, you claim here that you go, you can go down to masses of one GB, which means that uh, if you're at mid rapidity and it's back to back and uh, you have uh, photons of, of 500 MeV, how, how can you, first of all, how can you reconstruct those photons in, in Atlas? And secondly, how can you trigger on those? Because right now in CMS, we try to lower, uh, we have to, Im to impose a pre-scale in the single uh, ET uh, above 2 GB th uh, th trigger yeah. threshold. So Below this, we are just, uh, I mean, we're triggering every single bunch because of the noise in the calorimeter. Yeah. So how do you want to do this? In so, 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 okay, sorry for not being super clear here. So what, what this means is, first of all, the energy threshold of a cluster would be 1 GB. So we, we just cannot go below that. <laughs> That, that's, that's the first thing. And then if, if you go away from central rapidity, but you go to forward rapidities, then you gain by the, um, by, by the topology. So then your whole event is longitudinally boosted. So you gain a little bit in the inherent mass because your, your energy is still 1 GV, but your transverse energy becomes lower. And this is something we did not employ at all. And uh, unless I did um, a mistake in the calculation, which of course is possible. So um, within ETA 2.5, the, the lowest invariant masses that you can reach is just above one GB. But then of course, your statistics goes down by a lot because you're only looking at the far end of the rapidity spectrum. This is what I wanted to say here. This what, is the resolution, what is the resolution for photons here? How so at, it, in this ETA range, so, so ETA 2.5, the resolution is, is still as good as in the central uh, part. So the, the... What? I mean, for a 1 GV, what, what is it? I mean, for 1 GV photon, the resolution is maybe... Um, it's not, for 1 GV, it's not good. It's, it's probably 40%. Okay. 
well, so so okay. So is this the, so how do you want to separate any action peak from any uh, scalar or tensor hydronic resonance uh, in the one to three? Okay, the one to four, you already have the, the Charmonia scalars already. How yeah. do you want to separate this with the, a resolution of 40%? Uh, that's a very good question. Very good. Marco? Well, regarding this last question we discussed about uh, the guitar cut and also its uh, resolution, I mean, what you said applies to the, the CMS and Atlas, as well. but I guess we'll hear more about the Alice and LHCB throughout this uh, meeting. So I don't know if somebody from Alice and LHCB wants to comment already now or wants to postpone that discussion to the respective talks. I think Murilo wants to discuss this. I'm eager to hear his talk. Uh, LHCB has possibilities here, of course, that we don't have. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes, I, I, would, I would discuss that on my talk. Okay, then maybe I'll wait with my question. Thanks. <laughs> okay, so 